When Kyle Busch took the checkered flag at the Auto Club Speedway in February 2023, it was more than just the last cup race held at the track, and more than the first win Busch scored for Richard Childress Racing. It was also the first victory for sponsor Lucas Oil, which had been an active sponsor in NASCAR since the late 1990s. The first driver they sponsored happened to have been among the first to race on the Fontana track in 1997, Larry Gunselman. I was the very beginning of the Lucas deal in, in, in NASCAR, and now it's now they, they you know are to the point where they're out there and they want to race. And that's I think that's great. I think that's totally awesome. So and, and it's been good to see the, the success that Lucas Oil has had because I said I remember when I first met Forrest Lucas, he was in a little teeny warehouse with maybe ten or fifteen employees and he had a, a little laboratory at the back of it that was, you know, about the size of a large bedroom. And he was just like the mad scientist back there doing his thing. It was so funny. So, <laughs> <laughs> and now he's become very, very successful and, and done, done incredibly well. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy for him. But Gunselman was more than a driver. He was also a team owner. And in 2004, set out to start a single car effort of his own in the NASCAR Nextel Cup Series. This car, too, would carry logos for Lucas Oil, but would do so while running further back in the pack, battling Morgan Shepard, Andy Belmont, Joe Rutman, and others. Here is that story. As if by divine retribution, they returned for the brink of extinction in even greater numbers. They aroused anger in some, admiration in others, but each new 2004 was their chance to rise. They were the Field Fillers! Larry Gunselman was born December 1, 1960 in Washington State, an area not known at the time for its ties to racing. I grew up in a very small, very poor family up at the Sun Hood Canal in the Puget Sound area, as far, far away from the racing world as you could possibly get. And, and I just always was very, very mechanical uh, ever since I was a very small, small kid and uh, started getting into cars as soon as, well, well, actually back when I was in my early teens. Uh, I think you know, I owned a car two years prior to getting my driver's license. Uh, so I just always was working on cars. While he always had a passion for cars, Gunselman first pursued a career in aviation. In 1979, when he was fresh out of high school, he worked for the Boeing Airplane Company, servicing onboard air conditioning units. But after working with his uncle Ed in Boeing's wind tunnel, Gunselman learned the intricacies of aerodynamics and became a fabricator. Skip Eiler used to tell me I could, he was a crew chief back in the day, he he, uh, he told me I could build a space shuttle with a Leatherman tool and a pair of duckbill pliers. <laughs> <laughs> Gunselman still had the racing bug and soon after started running sprint cars. He befriended another mechanic who raced at the Spanaway Speedway and started running there in 1983. Gunselman won Rookie of the Year at Spanaway and soon competed at other tracks across the Pacific Northwest. On September 30th, 1990, when he was still working at Boeing, Gunselman made his first start in the NASCAR Winston West Series at Washington's Tri-City Raceway. He started 16th in a field of 22 and climbed to 11th. He then managed to buy Mark Walbridge's team in 1991. He ran three races for the season-best sixth at the Evergreen Speedway. Running the number 60 to match his birth year, Gunselman remained a part-timer in the West Series, but made the most of each of his runs. On July 24, 1993, he finished fifth at the tiny South Sound Speedway, his first top five and only his tenth series start. He also attracted sponsors, including Avenue D Signs, Bellex Skylights, and Northwest Outfitters. In 1996, Gunselman earned a ride in the number 37 entry fielded by Tamara Turner, a car that won the 1995 West Series title with Doug George. With a full-time ride for the first time, Gunselman quit his job at Boeing to focus all his attention on racing. At Mesa Marin on April 27th, in just his third start with the team, Gunselman took the lead from Bobby Gill with 17 laps to go and pulled off the victory. It was the first time he'd even led one lap of a West Series race. Outside of row number four, this is the race team that won the championship with Doug George behind the wheel here last year. 
This man in his first full year of Winston West Series after seven of eight years off and on, picked up his first win earlier this year at Mesa Marin, currently third in the point standings, formerly from right here in the Seattle, Washington area, now makes his home in Sierra Village, California in the race stop Olson Technology Ford Thunderbird. Let's welcome him back, Larry Gutzelman. All right, Larry, I understand this is your fifth race here at Evergreen. You're starting eighth. Uh, you set the cards up for long runs. Is that your secret to go to the front? That's what we plan. There's, this track's awful hard on tires, so we're going to see if we can't keep the Hoosier tires under this race stuff, pull some technology forward, and move it to the front. By November, when he finished fourth in the first race held at the new Las Vegas Motor Speedway, Gunselman finished third in the series standings behind Lance Hooper and Jeff Crow. Running in the Winston West Series also gave Gunselman his first taste of Winston Cup, thanks to the companion races that were held on tracks where both series competed at the same time. On May 5, 1996, he made his Cup debut at Sears Point, qualifying next to last for an event where another five West drivers missed the show. Though he only finished 36, this was actually second best in class, one spot and one lap behind Jeff Crow. He qualified for the Sears Point race again in 97, but this time the rear end failed in the closing laps, leaving him 38. That with Eric Holmes. Oh, there's the battle for the lead. Oh, little left tap, and Gunsman goes sideways. Here comes Gunsman, and he taps Woodside. Woodside saws the wheel. Gunsman tried to get in in a big way, and now Woodside trying to chop him off. Here comes Gunsman on the inside. Oh, and Gunsman's way loose. Here comes Woodside to the inside. He's going back to the lead. Down the back stretch from Sean Woodside, but Gunselman's not through yet. One lap to go in what has turned out to be a brawl. Very tough break, great racing, good short track racing. Uh, summarize it for us. Well, it was a good race all, all race long. Uh, it's pretty close between the top four or five cars. I think it was pretty obvious we had the fastest car, and, and we just got a little bit of bad luck. We, we had, ran out of gas there about halfway through, and we had to come in and and we didn't know if we'd lost lap or not and didn't get a call from NASCAR quick enough to know and ended up coming in and they they made us come in for a stop and go so we lost the lap and that really put us behind and my guys just struggled real hard and we got back on the lead lap and thought we had her one there and Sean got into me when I was leading and turned me around and those things happened in racing and if there had been another two laps I think somebody else would have been sitting in the winner's circle of this event. While he didn't win any West Series standalone races in 97, Gunselman nearly quadrupled his lap's lead total and still claimed fourth in the standings. Still another perk to his West Series experience was competing in the first two exhibition races held at Suzuka Circuit Land in Japan. After finishing 23rd of 27 drivers in the 1996 inaugural, he returned in 97 to finish a solid 15th out of 30, three laps down to Mike Skinner. The car he ran in 97 had particular significance. The chassis, prepared by Bill Schmidt, was one of the last cars Davey Allison ever raced. On June 27, 1993, just 16 days before his death, Allison finished 18th in a West race at the Evergreen Speedway. Four years later, Gunselman, who finished one spot ahead of Allison that day, used this car to begin the longest running sponsorship deal of his career. Through mutual friend Ron Hornaday, he had met Forrest and Charlotte Lucas of Lucas Oil. So anyway, long story short, I met Forrest and Charlotte Lucas and went down and and, uh, and spent some time with Forrest in his little uh, lab that he had there in Cordova, um, or Corona, where his shop used to be. Mm -hmm. And I got to know, and I got to know Forrest and, and Bob, I think it was Bob Patterson was the VP there. Bob was big into drag racing, and Forrest was like the circle car stuff, so anyway, so we were going to Japan in 1997, I believe, um, and the second year, we went, as I said, went two years, but I believe it was 1997, and, and Forrest wanted to be involved in that program, so that was when I was, that's, that is the official first race that Lucas Oil was ever on a Winston Cup car, was Japan, and I think, well, I don't want to say it was 97. Wow. You can go in there and look at the Suzuka results because it would have been known as the sponsor. I think it was 97. So that was the first, that was Lucas's first involvement in, um, in NASCAR. The Lucas sponsorship continued into the first few West races of the 1998 season, 
but Gunselman made just three of the first four races, failing to qualify for the companion event at Las Vegas before Tamara Turner's team closed its doors. It could have been the end, but Gunselman was determined to continue his climb through the ranks, so he loaded up his motorhome and set out east. Gunselman found a home at the Charlotte area shop of Joe Falk, who fielded the number 91 Chevrolet in the Winston Cup Series. Falk's team, LJ Racing, was in just its second season, having pieced together a part-time single-car effort with Mike Wallace, Greg Sachs, and a rookie in Kevin LePage. LePage stayed on for the first part of 98 in a bid for Rookie of the Year, but at mid-season left to replace Ted Musgrave at Roush Racing. From there, the summer's driver rotation consisted of Tommy Kendall, Andy Hillenberg, Morgan Shepard, and Todd Bodine. Gunselman and Todd were both competitors and friends. The 1998 race at Las Vegas saw Todd miss the show along with Gunselman, Todd's third DNQ in a row for the ill-fated Tabasco Pontiac. Todd had since left the team, and now reunited with Gunselman as co-workers at Falks. Gunselman worked wherever he could, serving as a spotter and driving Todd's motorhome on top of his role as a fabricator. The hard work paid off as Todd continued to surprise in Falk's Chevrolets. He ran 12th at Martinsville, 15th at Charlotte, then in the rain-delayed Atlanta finale took home 5th, Todd's first top 5 finish in over 3 years. Another beneficial connection was Mike Hillman, who took the place of Doug Richard as crew chief for the Falk team. Around this time, Hillman moved from team to team, and as Gunselman describes, often brought the same group of crew members with him. We all worked together. There was a whole group of us, about 10 of us, that worked in the shop and built all these race cars, and a lot of them went over to, to wherever, wherever Mike Hillman went, they went. <laughs> you know? and they went from, from Joe Falk to Don Arnold to Bob Germain. Uh, and, and throughout that, and so I said I maintain that friendship and, and, and relationship with a lot of those guys still to today that we all work together. By the year 2000, Hillman had moved on to serve as crew chief for, you guessed it, Brett Bodine. He replaced Greg Eli at Pocono in June. Gunselman still worked for the team, having been out of the driver's seat since his last West Series run in 98. He finally got the chance to drive again in August, where he began a three-race stint for Bob Brevac in the Craftsman Truck Series. Gunselman's debut came in the first of only two truck races held at the Chicago Motor Speedway in Cicero, where he finished 32nd after a crash. After running 26th in his other two starts, he reunited with Joe Falk for a chance at the Cup race at Charlotte, but ended up with one of seven DNQs. It was then that Gunselman landed his second major sponsor in Waterloo Tool Storage. The sponsorship deal came together before he'd landed a ride for 2001. He brought it to Mike Mittler, whose business in making fabrication tools was a good fit with Gunselman's own preference for fab work since his days at Boeing. Mittler had not fielded a truck since the death of his driver Tony Roper in a crash at Texas the previous October. Not wanting to run Roper's number 26 on Gunselman's truck, Mittler asked Gunselman what number he'd like to run. And I used to drive by the Missouri battleship every day going to school in Bremerton Shipyard. That's why the, that's why Mike Mittler's truck is the number 63, by the way. He says, what number do you want to be? And at that point in time, Addington had the number 60 in the truck series, which was, had been my number when I raced Winston West. So I'm like, well, I used to have to drive by that big old battleship, and my dad served on it for a little while back in the day. And uh, so let's go with the number 63. And, and 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 I changed the paint scheme from the the previous blue and other different colors that he had to the red and the white, which Mike Mittler kept that paint scheme and that number all the way up until he passed away. In the number 63, Gunselman qualified for 18 of the season's 24 races and achieved modest success. After crashing in Daytona, he and one other crew member put two new sides on the truck and qualified it into the next round at Homestead. But their truck still had a 9.5 to 1 compression ratio engine and a field of new 12 to 1 P7 motors, ultimately putting them out after only three laps and leaving them in last place. Gunsman's best finish in the 63 was a 16th place showing in the first truck race held at Kansas, a race won by Ricky Hendrick. He finished 23rd in points. Efforts then turned towards 2002, and the season opener in Daytona. Gunselman then drew on his aerodynamics experience from Boeing to make the number 63 as sleek as possible. Back then, there was, there was a, it wasn't a template, it was a, NASCAR called it a gauge. 
and it went from the point, thir- I think it was 13 inches back from the edge of the hood, went over the front fender down to where the two bumper pieces met on the front bumper. So it was, you know, a foot, probably 8, 17, 18 inches. Mm-hmm. And the rule, the rule was that it had to touch at both ends. Didn't say anything about the middle. So okay. I cut, and that was that was all part of the fiberglass composite nose. So I cut that entire area out of the composite nose, which was legal at the time, and and refabricated the entire front fender out of metal. And in that area, uh, which you know was a high downforce area, I was able to suck the front end in enough. I could I could put my arm through the center of that gauge, that piece of metal that went touching at the top and the bottom. I could put my arm through to my shoulder, so I narrowed the I, I narrowed the cross section of that truck up by about eight inches at the highest drag point on the front end. So it made a it was it made a huge difference. So much of a difference, in fact, that Gunselman's was the fastest Ford in preseason testing. This caught the attention of Jack Roush. Jack Roush's guys came over. It's like you know you, you're the fastest Ford, and we know your motors aren't anywhere near as good as us. And we know you built this truck. Can you, can, can you come build the front end for one of our trucks? And I'm like, yeah, if I get to drive it. <laughs> this wasn't the only connection Gunselman had with Roush or his drivers. Carl Edwards used to clean my windshield. He show, <laughs> nobody, knew who, nobody knew who Carl Edwards was. He was just a guy from Columbia because we were in Missouri and Forestell, Missouri. Uh, was where the race shop was up and Carl lived over in Columbia which was about an hour or so away and he'd come by the race shop and he was trying to get his career going and and he'd go to the races and help out where he could. In the truck series opener at Daytona for 2002, Gunselman qualified 17th and ran as high as third. But the engine blew near the halfway point, leaving him 31st. He made only three more starts for Mittler before his truck from Daytona found success with the team's windshield cleaner. So that that very same truck that I built that ran so good at Daytona, uh, once the decision was made for me to go bush racing, that's the truck that the truck that Carl drove in Kentucky for Mike Mittler later on that season, and that's where he got noticed by Jack Roush and kind of started uh, Carl Edwards' uh, racing career was in the truck that I built with you know built by myself. And, spent all all winter building that truck so that's kind of an ironic funny story he's he probably gave me a hard time he says i used to call you mr gunselman <laughs> so that was that so we still <laughs> and we still remain friends to this day the reason gunselman left the mittler team came down to a sponsor conflict between title sponsor craftsman and his own sponsor waterloo tool storage the two companies had an ongoing business relationship that could potentially create confusion on top of this, Gunselman's sponsor payment came in the form of free toolboxes, which he then had to sell to fund the team. With that, Gunselman decided to take his Waterloo branding to the Bush Series and signed with Fred Bickford's team DF2 Racing the remainder of 2002. He ran no better than 25th for the team, but returned to full-time racing in 2003, this time with longtime team owner Wayne Day in the number 16. He ran better, taking 18th at Talladega and was just hanging on to 20th place in points with two races to go. Unfortunately, he lost the engine at Rockingham. Handling issues stopped him at Homestead, just enough to leave him 21st. To start the 2004 season, Gunselman had landed a three-race Bush Series deal with McDonald Motorsports, one that would expire when Jason White took over in the fourth round at Darlington. During those first few races, Gunselman, who had saved his money, was already preparing to return to the Cup Series, looking to take advantage of the shortage in teams. Gunselman reached out to Bill Edwards, who along with his wife Paulette, once owned Mach 1 Incorporated. It was this team that in the 1980s fielded Harry Gant's Skull Bandit Chevrolets, with support from Hollywood director Hal Needham. After Gant and Skull left at the end of 1988, leaving behind crew chief Travis Carter, Bill and Paulette hired Rick Mass to run an unsponsored number 66 Chevrolet in the Daytona 500. As you may recall from my video on Daryl Waltrip's 2000 Victory Tour, Mass impressed, leading nine laps and finishing in sixth. The team was sold in 1990, and while Travis Carter did start his own team right after, Gunselman says the Edwards family didn't sell it to him. They instead sold to Ray DeWitt, with D.K. Ulrich formed what would become the number 77 Jasper Motorsports team, Radius Motorsports. It's kind of a funny story that, he, that Bill would tell him that, that 
Ray DeWitt would just fall if he was like stalking him <laughs> all around Denver, <laughs> trying to get him to sell him that race. <laughs> oh, that's something. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so finally, he just said he named the price, and he ended up buying it. And Bill stepped in. Out. Regardless, the Edwards family was out of the racing business for more than a decade until Gunselman came forward with his proposal. Bill was a supporter of mine, you know, with advice and everything else, and, and I went to him and said, "Hey, you know, there's a there's there's an opportunity to to go uh, to go maybe make some cup races, and 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 and, and I, you know, I kind of like to figure out a way to make this work." And so he he called his wife and he says, "You guys run down to." run down to People's Bank over in Denver, North Carolina and, and get the VP to, to loan you $40,000 so these, you know, so these guys can get started trying to make this race and thing work. So that was our, that was our seed capital <laughs> wow. to, uh, to get started. Gunselman and the Edwards family pooled their money and reestablished Mach 1 Incorporated for the NASCAR Nextel Cup Series. To save money, since Gunselman had already bought his NASCAR driver's license, Bill Edwards bought the owner's license, meaning Edwards would be the listed owner while Gunselman still operated the team. Bill also leased his shop in Denver, North Carolina to his son Chris, who became the team's bookkeeper and also selected the car number 98. The team went to Rick Russell, whose company's Second Chance Race Parts had also partnered with Kirk Shelmerdine's startup team. From Russell, they bought a former number 28 car from Robert Yates Racing, painted it white, and pieced together their only motor from Russell's second-hand parts. Among those helping was John Reiser, father of Matt Kenseth's crew chief Robbie Reiser, who was another good friend of Bill Edwards. Mach 1 didn't enter the 2004 Daytona 500, but did plan to run the following Nextel Cup race at Rockingham with Gunselman as driver. Gunselman confirms he was not entered in a Jay Robinson-owned Chevrolet for that race, as the current results reflect. Unfortunately, the number 98 car wasn't ready, and the team had to withdraw and instead prepare for the long drive to the third round in Las Vegas. Making that drive was none other than Captain Ron. Long before his current job driving the hauler for Live Fast Motorsports, the voice of Lefty Lucy Righty Tidy on YouTube steered Mach 1's hauler across the country. Gunselman has the story. Oh, Captain Ron, he cracks me up. So um, we were having our rear end gears and uh, transmissions were being reworked by uh, by Scott Estep, who at the time was doing stuff for Gibbs Racing, but he also had his, his side business doing stuff. So he was he was our gear guy. And and Scott, you know, we were looking for a truck driver. And Scott came to me and said, I know this guy. He's kind of a, a little different, but he's got a heart of gold and he'll give you He'll give you 100% all the time, and but he's and he's a truck driver, but he's got a lot of other skills. And I'm like, well, at that point in the game, we were looking for people with multiple skill sets. Uh, and and Ron was a good fabricator and 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 had a lot of experience in that stuff. Plus, he could drive the truck. And that's kind of how. And, and this was you know during the 2004 season, so that's when we we brought Ron in to drive the truck and and, and got started. And of course, he's you know still involved and got his own YouTube channel and all the rest of the stuff today. So, yes, I am responsible for Ron Utter. In Vegas, the car still wasn't ready, but this time was presented for inspection, turned a few laps in practice, and did take a lap in qualifying. Welcome back to Las Vegas, where the Lucas Oil Ford of California's Larry Gunselman, a Bush Series regular, times in at 33.51. Unlike Rockingham, there were 44 drivers entered for 43 spots. And Gunselman missed the show. But this attempt would still help the team going forward as they tried to secure a higher rank in owner points. For as much as Gunselman wanted to drive, he also knew he was one of only three full-time crew members for the team, which included Chris Edwards. And with Gunselman's skills in fabrication, his time was better used growing their fleet of cars. After their first car, the former Robert Yates entry from Rick Russell, Mach 1's second car was the Pontiac that Andy Belmont wrecked at Rockingham re-skinned as a Ford and set to run in Fontana. Next was at least one car from Brett Bodine's team, thanks to his friendship with the Bodine family. Then came others from Roush, including a super speedway car for Daytona in July. But if any of these cars were going to race, Mach 1 needed to start qualifying, and now. So while Gunselman focused on preparing the cars, he found a good qualifier to take his place behind the wheel. So I was a good friend with both with all three of the Bodines. So I got a hold of Todd Bodine because he, you know, was wasn't really all that busy at the time. And, 
and uh, so we got him to come try to uh, start following the puck qualifying the car because he was a much better qualifier than I was. It was March of 2004, after Todd Bodine lost his full-time cup ride with Bell Car Racing, but before he took the controls of Bob Germain's number 50 at Arnold Motorsports. In between, Todd had been testing an ARCA car for Dan Shaver and Petro Express's number 49 team, which planned to run in the Bush Series race at Nashville, with Jeff Bice as crew chief. In between, Todd shook down Gunselman's number 98 at Atlanta, where there would again be 44 drivers entered for 43 spots. Todd Bodine is the uh, new driver this week in the Lucas Oil, number 98. The final spot in the field came down to Todd and one of Atlanta's most successful drivers in Morgan Shepard. The tie was broken by attempts, putting Todd into the race and sending Shepard home. Todd started 38th in Sunday's race, but cited engine issues after the first 16 laps and finished in 41st. Ironically, this put the Mach 1 team in a superior position the next week at Darlington, where the 2004 points would determine how provisionals would be awarded. With the car's nose sealed up almost entirely, Todd qualified once more, this time taking 35th on the grid and sending home Stanton Barrett with WW Motorsports. Shepard also qualified for that race, and it was Todd who bumped Shepard sideways as both tried to avoid a wrecking Michael Waltrip. Following Andy Hillenberg's crash with Jeff Gordon, Todd pulled out after 33 laps and finished in 40th, this time citing issues with the rear end. Next on the schedule came Bristol, where Mach 1 struggled to decide who would drive the car. Gunselman was on the first list, but three days before the race, that changed back to Todd Bodine. But Todd had an earlier commitment once again, this time as co-owner and crew chief for ASA rookie driver Travis Foster, who was set to make his debut that Saturday at the USA International Speedway. With 44 drivers still entered for the 43-car grid after the withdrawal of Larry Foyt, Gunselman wanted to have another veteran behind the wheel, so Todd invited his older brother Jeff. At the time, Jeff Bodine hadn't made a cup start since his previous summer at Michigan, where he filled in for brother Brett after his brutal crash in practice. He hadn't made a cup race at Bristol since 2001, but Jeff qualified for the race, putting Mach 1's car 34th on the grid. It was the third straight race where Mach 1 improved in qualifying. In June, Jeff talked about his own decision to come back. I was talking to Buddy Baker this morning and said it's hard to quit, he said. He said, I know what you mean. It's hard to stop going around in circles. I don't have anything else to do. I don't have any family. The family has grown up and the wife has gone. I don't have any distractions. I can do this 100%. This is all I want to do, really. In the race, Jeff turned 59 laps before brake issues put him out in 39th place. Much like his friendship with Todd Bodine, Gunselman shared in Jeff's own passion for building bobsleds, an effort which also involved Forrest Lucas of Lucas Oil. And we would do the annual event up at Lake Placid, where Rick Hendrick would fly all the drag racing guys and the NASCAR guys up to Lake Placid, and we'd go do the bobsled races, and Speed Vision would cover that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Forrest Lucas was very into that. He and Charles both would go to that event. In fact, they got turned upside down in a bobsled once up there, I believe. And, and I ended up just taking to the bobsled thing, actually finished third one of the years that they had the bobsled competition. Todd returned to drive at Texas the same weekend he served as Randy LaJoy's spotter for the Bush Series race. By now, Todd was looking to run some Bush races of his own. Rumors indicated Todd was reunited with Frank Cece Jr. and his five-man crew on putting together a deal for 2005. Todd qualified Mach 1's car for Sunday's 500 miler, but this time turned just five laps before engine issues. With four straight starts, but no finishes under power and no more than 59 laps completed in any of them, Mach 1 had seemed to establish itself as another start and park organization, like others mentioned so far in this series. But at least in the season's opening rounds, Gunselman says they were having actual mechanical issues with their cars. Early in the season, most of those were mechanic, actual mechanical issues because that was prior to us, you know, starting to get an inventory of cars and engines. We started out, like I said, with the one, the one car that we got from Rick Russell and the one engine. That's all we had. So we had, we had a few problems, and it was tired. You know, it was a tired old engine, so it was really not up to snuff. So uh, I would say maybe one or two of those were uh, races where we, you know, decided to park the car because we, it was the only one we had, um, and we couldn't jeopardize it and not 
be able to go to the race the following week. But those were all, like I said, that was in the first half a dozen races until mm-hmm. we got the chance and we started making some races and having some revenue coming in that we were able to, to acquire some more uh, some more cars and some more, more engines. So at least we knew we had a piece to take to the racetrack the following week. To improve their performance, Gunselman reached out to Jack Roush, who took notice of his fast Ford when he drove for Mike Midler. The 2004 season marked the first year that Roush partnered his engine program with Robert and Doug Yates, forming the Roush Yates engines of today. Uncertain if the partnership would work, Roush kept some of his own engines in stock. But when both Roush and Yates enjoyed a strong start to the year, these reserve engines were soon sold to Gunselman. These engines had less horsepower than those being built by Roush Yates, but they were as reliable as they were affordable. While other teams leased engines for between $40,000 and $50,000, Gunselman purchased his for only $25,000. He'd then run them three races at a time, keeping his per-race engine costs down to only six dollars to $7,000. We're reinvesting pretty much everything we win back into the race team and trying to look for a little bit of sponsorship help, so maybe we can work towards getting to the other end of that garage one day, said Gunselman on April 14th. People see that purse check at the end of the day and don't realize how much it costs to do this. There's not near as much money in it as people think. That's why the top teams are looking for $18 million a year. The competition is almost stiffer down at this end than down at the other end. The turnaround began the next round in Martinsville, where the team acquired some sponsorship from former Dave Marcus sponsor Inks Catering, which picked up space on the TV panel, plus door decals from the Holiday Inn where the team was likely staying. The weekend began with some controversy in qualifying. Just like Atlanta, there were 44 cars for 43 spots, and one of the last spots came down to Mach 1 and another field filler, this time Kirk Shelmerdine. While initial reports gave the spot to Shelmerdine, the last car to take time, further review of the rulebook handed it back to Todd. The change was made as the number 98 team had just earned its first provisional, one week after Shelmerdine used the last of his. For Shelmerdine, it was his first TNQ since the Daytona 500. For Todd, who started 39th, it was a chance to get Mach 1 to the next level. While he did fail to finish, again citing the brakes, he this time turned 151 of the 500 laps, securing the 39th spot. After failing to qualify at Talladega, Todd returned at Fontana, where this time he ran nearly the full distance. After qualifying 41st following an engine change, Todd stayed out early to lead lap 28, a first for the team. He then completed 209 of the 250 laps before the second engine let go, placing him 34th. Despite the modest result, Todd's run surprised their sponsor Lucas Oil, but maybe not in the best way. They were paying us by the lap. (laughs) Oh dear. By the lap. (laughs) So of course we had incentive to run as much, obviously run as much as we possibly could, and uh, and it kind of got got I think it got a little bit of sticker shot to them when we went to the to the first I think it was Fontana race which was their home track of course, and we ended up running and we ended up racing and, and finished the race. So it, it, you know it was the it was by far the big I think it was twenty thousand dollars or something so which wasn't a lot but for us it was a lot uh, that ended up being the bill for the sponsorship for that race. And, and that was when Bob Patterson came in and we said, whoa, 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 we got to scale this back a little bit. This is going to get a little proud of, you know, get out of our budget. This arrangement was probably renegotiated two weeks later at Richmond, where for the first time all year, the car had brake ducts installed on the nose. Here, the team reached another benchmark. During the off week, the team hired his crew chief, Mike Stewart, who most recently worked with fellow West Series racer Lance Hooper. It was under Stewart's watch that, for the first time all year, the number 98 car finished a cup race under power. Todd completed 373 of 400 laps in the 33rd spot. It was a small but important success and set the stage for an even bigger challenge the next week. With the following two races coming in Charlotte, Gunselman had time for a little joyride, courtesy of Jack Roush and his vintage airplane. During that all-star weekend, um Jack Roush calls me and says, I'm bringing one of my P-51s to Charlotte and I've got a tanker full of fuel and two parachutes and we're flying until we're done. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm in. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Me, me, Mike Wallace, Barney Hall, and one other guy, we met Jack out at Concord Airport 
He had his P-51 Mustang, Gentleman Jim there, and we flew as long as we could. He tried really hard to make me sick. He tried, we flew over, we flew over my house over on uh, Lake Norman, over by Lake Norman, and we're looking for the house, trying to find it. He's uh, talk to me, Goose, because I'm in the back seat of a P-51 Mustang, <laughs> which was never, de never designed to have two people in it. Oh dear. <laughs> and Jack Roush is not very tall, and, and I'm not really very tall, but I'm taller than he is. So I'm all jammed in the back of this thing. My head's up against the canopy, and we're spending more time upside down than we are right side up. And he's trying really hard to make me sick. And I'm like, Jack, you don't want me to puke in the back of your airplane. So anyway, so we're doing all these you know, acrobatics and stuff and flying over the lake. So after we're done crying, my dad's out there with me and taking pictures and doing all the rest of the stuff. And, uh, and it was a great day. And so I get home, and I'm a little queasy. So I tell my dad, I said, I'm going to go take a nap for a little bit. Because I said, I'm a, I'm a little greener around the gills. Well, my phone rings. And it's Kim Fisher, who's Jack Roush's assistant. And says, this Larry? I says, yes, Jack wants to talk to you. So I get on the phone with Jack, and he's like, you got me in trouble. I said, how did I get you in trouble? You were driving. <laughs> 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 and he says, I just got a call from the FAA that they was a, a reported incident of a vintage wharf bird flying too low over Lake Norman. And he's laughing. And I'm like, are you serious? And he says, yeah, he says, but don't worry about it. It happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Back on the ground, Roush had provided Gunselman another of his engines to run in the upcoming All-Star event. But unlike the other field fillers from the last episode, Mach 1 Incorporated would not run the next Nextel Open. They didn't need to. By running Jeff Bodine earlier in the season, the team had secured a spot in the All-Star race itself. Jeff would qualify as a past winner, having won with his own team in 1994, and the rules at the time declared 2004 to be his final year of eligibility. Jeff would drive the second car from the team's stable, the former Andy Belmont car from Rockingham, and this time would welcome additional sponsorship from Winston Tires and ExtremeMotorcycles.com. We are excited to have Jeff behind the wheel for this event, stated Chris Edwards. We have been working with Jeff's brother Todd, and we have experienced some great results. So this timeout should not be any different. We are pumped. Starting 22nd, welcome the Chris Edwards team, headed by crew chief Mike Stewart. And the driver of the Lucas Oil number 98, winner of the 1994 All-Star Race, Jeffrey Bodine. Among the crew members being introduced here are both Larry Gunselman, who served as the catch can man, and Chris Edwards, who was the front tire changer. Uh, I would believe I was right smack in the middle of all. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to, I'd have to go back and look at the video, but yeah, I seem to remember. I was right. I, that was a really cool deal where they got the whole crew, in, and uh, and we had got a little bit of sponsorship for that race, and, and that was, uh, you know, Jeff was was you know still. You know, was pretty competitive and was obviously younger then now as he is now than than he is now and and and, and he had just come out uh, let's see because his his accident was in 2000 so he had you know, obviously he had a, a long road to recovery after after that accident and uh, but but he was still you know he still had all the skills and stuff and was still in great shape and and so I said uh, and having the the previous winner of the of the All Star race being a automatic eligible for the for the um, you know for the All Star was a uh, you know it was a, it was a great fit and him being brothers with Todd in the 90 lap main events Jeff qualified 22nd and last among the locked in drivers placing him ahead of transfer Sterling Marlin and Ken Schrader in the 24 car grid. Just like in the Nextel Open, Jeff had to get on the brakes when the leaders eliminated several early contenders. Well, how did Earnhardt used to sell you on pitting? He'd say, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 no. Trouble, man, big trouble. At least there. three cars. Oh, more. Lots of trouble Jeff up there. Jeff Gordon's involved. Kevin Harvick. I couldn't tell what happened, but somebody got into the back of the 16 car and turned him. Jeff remained at the tail end of the pack for the rest of the night using a lap in segment one, then drafting Schrader's damaged dodge in the closing laps. After Matt Kenseth got Ryan Newman loose to take the win, Jeff finished 16th, worth $71,300. As the summer stretch began, Mach 1 continued to fight for consistency. 
He entered Jeff Bodine in the same car for the following week's Coca-Cola 600, but failed to qualify in a massive entry list, joining nine DNQs. The next week at Dover, Larry Gunselman clocked in a lap of 148.533 miles per hour in practice, but ended up withdrawing his entry for the first time since Rockingham. The next race at Pocono was a track where Jeff Bodine won three times, so he was the easy choice to run the number 98. Qualifying was more of a challenge, but he did manage to make the show, securing the 43rd and final spot. This time, the resilient Roush engines pulled through. In a race that saw no fewer than 16 DNFs, most due to crashes or engine failures, Jeff had neither and finished in 28, completing all but six laps. It was the team's best run in a points race, and only the second time they'd taken the checkered flag under power. Jeff pulled through again the next week in Michigan, where this time he climbed from 42nd to finish 32nd, 10 laps down to race winner Ryan Newman. Team owner Chris Edwards was excited by the Michigan result. Now that we've accomplished one of our main goals to get ahead of some of the other teams that are back here struggling financially, our goal is to basically be the best of the rest since we got a late start. It's been really neat watching it grow. It was originally just going to run 8 to 12 races. Here we are. This is the 15th race we've been to now, including the All-Star race. It's been really neat, but it's been a lot of work at the same time. Another trip west brought the Nextel Cup Series to the Sonoma Raceway, where Larry Gunselman would drive once more. There, at last, Gunselman made his first cup start of the season, appropriate since it was the site of his last cup start in 1997. He drove for Tamara Turner's Winston West team. The preliminary entry list of 45 drivers had been cut to 43 for as many spots, beginning with Morgan Shepard, who didn't take time in qualifying. The other cut was a withdrawal of Rick Ware's entry, a Dodge that would have been driven by Carl Long. Instead, Gunselman would drive Ware's Dodge, which was redecorated as Mach 1's number 98. Gibson Products, Ware's sponsor, would join Lucas Oil as backer. So that, I'd gotten to know Rick, and I'd raced against Rick in the truck series. Uh, so I knew, so I knew Rick, and and uh, I'm really happy for the success he's having now. He's worked really hard and gone through some really tough times over the course of his career. So I'm glad to see the success he's having now. So yeah, we were obviously racing all the races at, at that point, and and Rick wanted he had a, a sponsor deal, and he wanted to go to uh, wanted to go to Sears Point. So we ended up using using his car with our number and our crew. Uh, you know, and then he came and came and helped. The weekend took a detour in practice when Gunselman lost his brakes going into turn 10, stuffing Ware's Dodge into the tire barriers. And we only had the one car, and obviously we're on the other side of the country, and, and, and ended up getting to the tire tire barriers. Ooh. I, I lit, and again, I'm, well, I was the fabricator guy. I literally cut the entire side from bumper cover to bumper cover off of that car in the garage area, beat all the dents out, straightened it all out, and then hung it back on the side of the car and went out and ran the race with it that way. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I got the whole side of the car. <laughs> that is something. <laughs> <laughs> and fix, fixed it and then put it back. And then, I mean, it wasn't pretty, but it was functional. Gunselman took the green in last place. Once again, the team completed nearly the entire distance, this time 87 of the 110 laps. But the Dodge failed to finish, this time for an altogether different reason. And then I think we ran out of gas or something on the last lap of that race, or oh, something goodness. happened. Something happened. I think we ran out of gas because because I I had to coast into the pits as I would have been coming to the checkered flag because I wasn't going to make it because and, <laughs> and I came into the pits as God, I can't remember who won that race. Uh, but anyway, I yeah. know Rick was Rick was like, why didn't why didn't we finish the race? Like, okay, we can go put some gas in it. We can go back out now. <laughs> there we go. Wasn't, wasn't much. Wasn't much I could do about it. Would have ended up stopping on the racetrack, and then would have had probably had a conversation with NASCAR that I wouldn't have liked. Next came the Pepsi 400 at Daytona, where the team would make another change. While Chris Edwards had picked number 98 at the start of the season, he was not the first to do so. For the first time since he closed his team at the end of the 2000 season, Bill Elliott decided to enter some leased Everham Dodges in a few races, and it himself selected the 98. Daytona marked the debut of this car. With Mach 1 essentially registered as the number 198, they would have to change numbers for Daytona, ultimately choosing the available number 96. The Super Speedway car they'd obtained from Roush Racing was also painted a glossy black, different from their traditional white. 
Though 49 drivers were entered at Daytona, Gunselman remained the driver and secured the 42nd spot on the grid. As the race's second half ran without a single yellow, both Gunselman and Morgan Shepard found themselves running alone, unable to keep up with the lead pack. In the final 50 laps, Shepard attempted to pull low in the trioval to allow a fast-closing Michael Waltrip to pass. Goes way, but uh, Michael had to run on the inside and hey, you, little smoke flew. That'll get your attention. Shepard came home 33rd with Gunselman 34th, one lap behind the 89 car, four down to race winner Jeff Gordon. Todd Bodine reunited with Gunselman to attempt the next three straight cup races, each with a different result. At Chicagoland, Todd was also entered in the Bush race for team owner Ted Marsh. Three years after winning the first cup pole at the track, he left as one of three DNQs. He rebounded to make the show in Loudoun, despite turning just one lap in qualifying. In the race, he ran over half the distance before the engine let go, leaving him 41st. Todd's final run came in the return to Pocono in August, where he started 37th and this time turned 72 laps before engine woes. This was Todd's last race for Mach 1 Incorporated, a subject on which Todd declined to comment when interviewed in 2022. But in August 2004, Todd did comment on the team and his decision to move to Arnold Motorsports. Larry Gunselman and Chris Edwards are just trying to get to the track, make the race, and build the team, said Todd. They have their certain goals they have to meet each week, and obviously that is not what I want to do. At the time, Todd wouldn't confirm that Arnold Motorsports was looking into entering the truck series. However, the move had reunited Todd with Mike Hillman, with whom Gunselman had worked in the past. Don Arnold and myself had talked before the season even started about trying to get together. He had made some commitments to Derek Cope, felt obligated to honor those commitments. It just worked out now that we got it together. Interestingly, it was Cope who took the place of Todd for the Brickyard 400 at Indianapolis. This was also the first time the Mach 1 car carried logos for AMW.com, product of a new tenant in Chris Edwards' shop. In May, it was rumored that Body Dynamics Racing Bodies Incorporated was shutting down, but the company instead moved their business to Mach 1 shop. The company soon after held a spring cleaning sale, getting rid of old sheet metal parts produced from 1998 through 2003. Body Dynamics had an association with John Walsh's popular TV show, America's Most Wanted, and together with Mach 1, conceived of a way to bring attention to the search for missing children. Chris Edwards supported the cause. A majority of our team members have children or relatives that are children, so we feel an obligation to assist in this case, in cases like this. We feel that with the NASCAR fan base, we should be able to help. With the exposure we can get from the media for these children, we are sure someone might see them and call. For Derek Cope's car at Indianapolis, the quarter panels carried photos of Sam and Lindsey Porter, a missing brother and sister from Independence, Missouri. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children also joined the effort. Cope, who had just shaved his trademark mustache, qualified for the race, securing the 43rd and final spot once more. He turned 55 laps and did in fact get the car some visibility by staying out to lead lap 47 under caution. Derek Cope stayed on track while the others pitted to lead a couple of laps. He heads to pit road, so Jeff Gordon will go back into the number one spot as the pace car heads for the pit lane and we go back racing. He fell out soon after, citing a vibration that was credited with a 40th place finish. Moving ahead to Watkins Glen, Mach 1 was still looking for associate sponsors for the upper hood, lower TV panel, and upper C-post. Gunselman would drive the car as he had in Sonoma, but this time in his own Ford, while Rick Ware entered Stanton Barrett in his Dodge. A rained out qualifying session put Gunselman 43rd on the grid and sent Barrett home. Unlike Sonoma, the number 98 turned only two laps in Sunday's race, citing transmission problems as his reason for falling out. There's another short day the next week in Michigan, where this time steering issues ended Derek Cope's day after 49 laps, placing him 41st. The next three races each saw no fewer than seven teams fail to qualify, and each time Derek Cope got Gunselman's car into the race. At first, the team seemed determined to run longer. At Bristol, Cope turned 121 laps before brake issues left him 38. Then came a frustrating weekend in Fontana, began at the end of his first lap in qualifying. See him coming off turn four, gets loose with him, skims the wall there, roof flaps come up. It's gonna go up and just hit the wall again with the right rear, right front. 
This was on his first lap, so he did not get a time in. And uh, with where he's at in owner points with five cars going home, he's going to be a little bit on the borderline. Heard him trying to gas it up, trying to keep it off the wall, but the, the speed he was carrying uh, maybe didn't hit it quite as hard as he as if he hadn't uh, gassed it up. Hope still made the show, and the crew pieced his car back together to run in their sponsor's race. Another team that wrecked in qualifying wasn't so fortunate, as they required both a driver change and a backup car. During Disney's on-track filming of Herbie Fully Loaded, the iconic Volkswagen lined up 44th on the grid, which put the 43rd place Mach 1 car into the film. Beautiful weather and a great field of Nextel Cup cars as they head out onto the track for their two pace laps. It was Herbie that pulled off the track early this time. The Gunselman team ran nearly the entire race distance, just as they had in the spring. While we're running 17 laps down on lap 171, something broke heading into turn one. Mm. Well, something something came loose or broke on that car way before he got to the corner. And he was not in any hurry to get out of that car. As a matter of fact, he just now is getting out. It's like he's favoring his foot. Oh, I see. That looks like he's still favoring his foot, doesn't it? That's a hard hit. Bottom of the top of the racetrack for Derek. Of course, uh, the problems uh, beginning on pit road with a little fire during the stop and compounding themselves there. And now uh, we'll hope Derek's okay. After that, the runs became shorter. At Richmond, Cope turned 30 laps before ignition problems kept him 42nd. Cope also made the chase opener at Loudoun, where qualifying was canceled by rain. This time he turned just 50 laps. It was again ruled out by ignition failure. Fall race at Dover saw Jeff Bodine take the controls for the first time since June race at Michigan. He secured 41st on the grid, but this time made it just 40 laps before a loss of oil pressure. Next came the fall Talladega race, where many field fillers looked to capitalize on the opportunity for a good finish. After failing to qualify for the spring race, then running well off the pace in the July event at Daytona, Larry Gunselman would again pilot the team's black Ford, this time with the trademark number 98. At last, it was a return to form from the team's promising runs of the summer. Gunselman finished 33rd, last car to come home under power, and completed all but five of the 188 laps. By the next round at Kansas, where Gunselman qualified his car in 40th, he was scuffing tires for other teams. I remember at Kansas in 2004, um, everybody wanted to stick a tire, or scuff tires. So during happy hour, that was my deal. I said, I'll go scuff the set of tires. We were doing pit stops, you know, full-on pit stops during happy hour because I was coming in, and, and then every time I'd come in, there'd be four or five more sets of sticker tires sitting there from other teams. So the one I think I scuffed 15 or 16 sets of tires during happy hour at $2,000 a set because it, it was my deal with it. If I scuff a set, you pay for a set of stickers for me at a later point in time. Gunselman turned just 26 laps that day, finishing next to last. He tabbed Jeff Bodine to make another bid at Charlotte, but this time their all-star qualifier found himself one of no fewer than 11 DNQs. For Martinsville, Gunselman brought on Chad Chaffin, who at the time was closing out a strong truck series season with Bobby Hamilton Racing, with whom he claimed his first two wins at Dover and IRP. Chaffin had competed in the Bush Series for even longer, dating back to 1993, but had never once made a Cup Series race, nor even attempted to make one. Gunselman gave him that opportunity, and at time trials, the 35-year-old put the 98 car 37th on the starting grid. Chaffin turned 100 laps that day before rear-end issues, taking 39th. He would go on to make 13 more cup starts. This left just four races on the calendar, where the team brought on two-time Busch Series champion Randy LaJoy. LaJoy had last run a cup race with another field filler in Hoover Motorsports back in the spring race at Richmond. This time ran a new black and yellow paint scheme in Atlanta, again the number 96 due to the presence of Elliott. This proved to be the hardest qualifying session of the season, and after hitting the rev limiter on his lap, LaJoy was sent home with 16 other drivers. He rebounded to make the next race at Phoenix, where the team picked up new sponsorship from Air Raid Air Intake Systems. 
LeJoy started 41st and turned 105 laps before transmission issues left him 42nd. Rain then put LeJoy into his first ever Southern 500 at Darlington, having only run the spring race twice before. He also carried another new sponsor in BWAConstruction.com. One more push by driver and team, LeJoy nearly made it to the 400-mile mark, turning 262 laps before the engine let go. He then closed out the year with a DNQ in Homestead, the team's seventh DNQ of the year, but only the third of the season's second half. It was a challenging year, but Mach 1 still completed the 2004 NASCAR Nextel Cup Series season, qualifying for 26 of their 34 attempts, plus the All-Star race, finishing four of them under power and growing from a three-man to an eight-man crew. The team also completed more laps than many of the other field fillers, enough to rank 39th in owner points, third in class behind only Arnold Motorsports and Phoenix Racing. In so doing, Gunselman managed to avoid many of the controversies that faced other field fillers that season. I worked pretty hard to understand things from NASCAR's perspective, and, and I understood that it, we operated under the golden rule theory, that they had all the gold, so they made all the rules. <laughs> uh, and so you didn't want to cross them because they could make your lives really, really miserable. Um, so, you know, we, I, and I kind of had a, I kind of had a knack since I was, you know, more mechanical and fabricator, and I had a really good relationship with a lot of the uh, officials. So, kind of part of my thing was I'd, I'd distract the officials going through tech while the guys were trying to go through tech. So, you know, we might get something past them. So it was, uh, you know, kind of it's kind of kind of a little game that we all play. You know, if you, if you had something that you were trying to get by that was borderline, but we didn't have. Virtually none of the small teams like that, we didn't cheat intentionally. Because you can afford the fines. Certainly. Uh, as Carl Long found out all too well. William Edwards was also impressed by the team's progress. At the end of the year, it was, uh, it was a big deal for, for myself and Chris, because we got, you know, his, his father was kind of our mentor, and his father was a tough old guy. And, you know, he, and he'd bring us, at the end of the year, he brought us into the office and, and said how proud he was of everything that we did and everything. And, and Chris is like, that's the proudest my dad's ever been of me that I can remember. So oh, that, wow. uh, that that kind of that kind of you know hit, hit home with me because we I said we we worked really hard uh, to make to, to be successful and and, uh, and we and for the most part we were successful. Uh, so you know for what we started out we, we it all started out with a forty thousand dollar people's bank loan. But in late December, the Edwards family bought out Gunselman's interest in Mach One Incorporated. We are 100% focused on preparing for Daytona, said Chris Edwards. Last year was our first year in Nextel Cup. It was a building year for us, our rookie year, so to speak. We are working hard to become more competitive and improve our race team. At the time of the split, the team still hadn't landed a sponsor for 2005, but planned to run the full schedule. They first re-signed Randy LaJoy, who had rounded out their 2004 season. I'm looking forward to getting in the 98 car, said LaJoy. I've been in this business for some time now, and one thing is for sure, you never stop learning. The rule changes are constant, so you have to stay on top of your game to be competitive. I'm excited that this comes only two weeks after my full-time Bush Series ride announcement was made. I hope that what I learned in the Bush car will transfer over to my cup ride. Any additional time on the track does nothing but help me as a driver. I'm focused on becoming a better driver, helping Mach 1 become competitive and succeed in the next L Cup Series. After having to change car numbers from the 98 to the 96 due to conflicts with Bill Elliott's team in 2004, Mach 1 decided to change their car number permanently, something no one else had yet claimed. They picked the number 34. The change between the 98 and 96 confused a lot of folks last year, said Chris Edwards on January 22, 2005. I received questions from friends, sponsors, and even officials when we had to switch numbers. I'm glad we don't have to deal with that issue this year. NASCAR has already transferred my owner points from last year over to the number 34. With a switch from Ford to Chevrolet, LaJoy showed promising speed in testing, ranking 7th of the 54 teams that tested. In the separation, Gunselman kept a couple cars and teamed up with Rick Ware to also attempt the Daytona 500 in 2005. The former teammates ended up in different dual races. In race 1, Mach 1 entered LaJoy without Lucas Oil as sponsor. 
Carr instead promoted Wes Craven's upcoming werewolf movie, Cursed, starring Christina Ricci. But LaJoy spun early, and ultimately lost the engine, leaving him 27th of 29 starters. In race two, Gunselman avoided several crashes to take 18th, but like LaJoy, had missed the 500 field. Through 2005, Mach 1 Incorporated made another nine races, but didn't finish any of them. In fact, only once did they finish better than 41st, which was the 36th at Las Vegas after mid-race engine trouble. You may recognize the number on LaJoy's number 34, is that from a team that's still in operation today. This is not a coincidence. Another DNQ from the 2005 Daytona 500 was Stanton Barrett, who drove the number 92 Chevrolet. This car was owned by Tennessee businessman Bob Jenkins, who in 2004 partnered with Cup Series veteran Jimmy Means to form Means Jenkins Motorsports. Starting with the night race at Bristol, the Means Jenkins 92 had been entered in seven Nextel Cup races, hiring Barrett after Brad Teague, Tony Raines, and Derek Cope. But four times the team withdrew, and the other three were DNQs. In 2005, the 92 team rebranded itself as Front Row Motorsports, and Barrett broke through with the team's first start in the spring race at Bristol. While Mach 1 struggled, Front Row improved, qualifying for 13 races, finishing under power in nine of them. Their season-best 20th place finish came on a confusing weekend at Talladega, where both Front Row and Mach 1 sold their starting spots to fully funded teams that missed the show. Front Row's Chevrolet was re-decaled into PPI's number 32 Tide Ride for Bobby Hamilton Jr. Mach 1 got Front Row's driver Mike Skinner into their Ford, which was redecorated into Michael Waltrip Racing's entry. Hamilton took 20th for Front Row, while poor Mach 1 finished last, Skinner collected in a lap 19 pileup. By the second race of the 2006 season, Mach 1 Incorporated had gone out of business. They sold the number 34 entry to Front Row, which moved into the Edwards family's shop in Denver after an auction. It was this number 34 team that gave Front Row their first cup start of the year in Las Vegas with Chad Chaffin. Their next key hire was John Andretti, who gave Front Row's number 34 its first Daytona 500 start in 2008, then its first full season effort in 2009. The car that is today driven by 2021 Daytona 500 champion Michael McDowell and the team surrounding it owes its existence in no small part to what Larry Gunselman, the Edwards family, and Lucas Oil built at Mach 1 Incorporated. And on February 26, 2023, when Kyle Busch scored the first victory for Lucas Oil, the winning pass was made on Michael McDowell with 21 laps to go. Gunselman never qualified for another Cup Series race as a driver, but this is not the end of his story. Nor is it the entire story of one of his drivers, Todd Bodine. On top of Mach 1 and Arnold Motorsports, there was a third team he helped build, with quite the tale of its own. exists a sport that is driven by the fans. They are why everyone works so hard on the teams and at the tracks, in front of the grandstands and behind the scenes to give the fans the greatest race possible. NASCAR fans deserve the best, starting from the high banks of Daytona all the way to the shores of California and at every race in between. NASCAR fans, you're the reason for our success. Thanks.